Welcome to a show about things you can see Without going far and a lot of them are free If you thought there was nothing in the old hard land You ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Randy does the steering so he won't hurl Mike's got the map, such a man of the world That's done with the camera, kinda heavy on his shoulder And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder Look out, they're driving hard Checking out art in their own backyard Look out, they're driving hard Checking out the world in their own backyard Checking out the world in their own backyard So how far are we driving? It's like, I don't know, 800, 2,000 miles. I can't remember. It's a long ways. We've got to get some coffee. Eat some coffee. Dear Let's TV go. mailbag, uh, who like let it, the right. weasels out? Home, home and stuff. what's home with the guy stuff. in the toga? Yeah. Hi, Don the Camera Guy here, once again poised to hit the road in search of great grassroots art and other suitably strange stuff. But first, a quick hometown fuel stop. Patron saint of bad habits here. You can, uh, if you pour a little coffee on him, that'll help a lot for his, uh, just a little splash right on the top. Oh, that's perfect. Well, that'll keep, keep you safe on the road. So now, stoked with good juju and even better Java, we reclaimed our only claim to fame, the world's largest ball of videotape, and proceeded towards yet another cramped Chrysler minivan. We're starting our journey across three states and hundreds and hundreds of miles, which, thanks to the magic of television, can take place in about this long. Whoa! Now here we are on a road that looks very Ozarkish, somewhere in southern Ohio, in pursuit of a castle that has a French name. In other words, pretty much business as usual. Nestled back here along the banks of the Little Miami, a Sunday school teacher named Harry Andrew spent 51 years building his own Norman-style chateau, aided in no small part by a group of lads he called his Knights of the Golden Trail, including one Joe Carey. He was just totally a jack of all trades. Uh, he got drafted out of uh, Colgate University where he was uh, studying to be an engineer and he spoke seven different languages and he had to go to Europe in World War I. He was knighted over in Europe for his bravery on the front lines uh, and he was a real knight. You he, know, he really not was. an honorary knight, so what's a real knight without a real castle? Uh, he came to Hamilton County, uh, hired him as a building engineer, but when the Great Depression came, he took a job as a school teacher. People would come down and help him and he he worked on it uh, during uh, the early years and everything as much as he could on weekends and when he could get down here. And then in 1955, he retired from Standard Publishing where he was an editor and he had enough done here to move in. That's why I say he was a true jack of all trades. He was an electrician and a plumber and he, he just did it all. This up here is the chapel and the knight's armor room and this is a nice sleeping quarters here. Look out down below, you English pig dogs! <laughs> There's stones that people have brought from every state, and we got almost every country. And when Sir Harry was doing the North Wing, he started inserting them in the, in the walls. These are, uh, were made out of milk carton yeah. bricks. He would take his milk cartons, and he would put them... Seal test? Put them up, up any kind. If it, hit them, it didn't matter what kind, whatever he could get and he'd put some concrete in him and then he'd, he'd stick a can or a light bulb or any garbage in him and then he'd finish filling them up and then when it dried he'd take the milk carton off and he'd have a brick. He did income tax, car titles and wills and if you brought him empty milk cartons he didn't charge anything. If you carried up rocks to come up he didn't charge anything to come in the door. Now is that the way the French built their castles? No. This type of castle was built by one man. Now, naturally, it's not as big as uh, some of the castles that he visited, but it's quite big for one man to build. And just like all the best French castles. Oh, and of course, all the, like all the French castles, you got your Pepsi machine. 
when people think of the 51 and a half years of labor to, of building the castle, that's not counting the years he had to learn how to do it. He was never afraid to do hard work and he had ways to trick you into doing work. So he was a motivator. Oh yeah, oh yes. He taught you how to put your toys away because the winner had to put the game all back together and set it up for next week and the loser had to get a rock. And what happened usually, wait for me, I'll go with you. And then the two of us would go down there, even the winner would go down there and get rock. You can see it's all physical labor. The rocks aren't, even little ones aren't light. And he was in tremendous health. Uh, he caught his pants legs on fire and ended up dying from that when he was 91 years old. The man was 91 years old and climbing up 10 foot uh, high uh, scaffolding and laying rock by himself. He gave 28 scholarships away and he spent all his money on the castle and he really didn't have a lot, he didn't have a lot of money when he died and everything, but look what he had. And then he, he, he left it to us knights and look what we have. The Knights of the Golden Trail still slay dragons or at least whack back weeds and keep the castle up to code. Even though Joe says they seldom drop water balloons on pesky visitors anymore, the boys seem fixated on that whole system of defense. Yeah, he was saying lead really is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, apparently, lead, because you can pick it up after lead it Lead and the tar. Tar is good. Look out down below, you English pig dogs! And then, of course, there's always the good old favorite, just human waste, yeah. which aren't so much lethal, but really insult the enemy. Yeah, and, apparently. And no shortage of it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we must hasten away from Harry's Haven and head for Hamilton. There's history here, they say. Almost too much for one sign to contain. Is this a monument or an eye test? Let me paraphrase. The park pays tribute to Captain John Sims. No, he didn't invent the bagel. He believed the earth was hollow and vowed to explore it. Hamilton, Ohio. The Hollow Earth Monument, 1829, and it's got a plaid cushion. He was convinced that the Earth was hollow and that we could you know, live down there and make a better world for ourselves. Now, this reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Journey to the Center of the Earth. If you have not seen it, you need to go out right now, rent it. It's got James Mason. Pat Boone. Pat Boone at his height, the peak of his career. When did that hollow earth thing get disproved, really? Well, you know, see, when did it come out? The early 1820s? I'd say basically by about the 1830s it was over. <laughs> well, remember, we're in Hamilton, the town that put an exclamation mark after its name. Hamilton! Hamilton! Right there! Right there! The proof! Hamilton! Guess all that exclamating has reinvigorated us yeah. since we're now speeding north towards Dayton. Hamilton! Yeah. Keeping a collective eye out for something near Carlisle that shouldn't be hard to spot. There it is, right there. Whoa, yeah. Whoa, baby. <laughs> say, there it is, right there. Now this flying saucer duplex is nothing we've ever seen before. Nor are we seeing any inhabitants either, which I guess accounts for this new journalistic low. Tell us about what would the spacemen look like when they landed? Were they tall? Yeah. Were they, were they big guys? Were they shiny? Are there more coming? Do you think Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame? Oh my God, I see them, they're horrible. Okay, now things are just getting silly. And we're starting to run late for our last stop of the day up the road in Wapakoneta. Wapak, as it's known, is known as Neil Armstrong's hometown but the Moon Museum has no pull on us. The place we seek is the Temple of Tolerance, and all we really know is that Jim Bowser's been building it in his own backyards. What I've done here is I tried to save this stone. I mean, people look at this and say, what is going on here? Uh, number one, architectural stone that's here. It's that unfortunate thing where they tear down buildings. And when they tear down these buildings, we lose all this hand-cut stone. So I thought instead of losing this, I'm going to collect it. Then I'm going to build it into something so intimidating that they can't tear it down and throw it away again. 
Then I got into the natural stone. My brother and I are archaeologists, and as I followed the glacier line, the glacier came into Ohio, and I followed the glacier line, I suddenly saw this igneous metamorphic rock, this rock that's banded. Well, my concept was, is if I get enough of these and I can build a huge thing with these, these origins of Earth, because these are four billion years old, I said, I'm going to have this temple with a lot of power, and that power comes from the origins of the Earth. So that's as strange as I'm going to get. Yeah, yeah. We should go, what we'll do is go all the way, how we go all the way to the back, you guys see the temple, and then as you see all this stuff, you'll decide what you want. And there's a million stories here. And another thing, as you see, you have to duck and weave, and here's what I tell people. This is really made for kids to play in. And I say kids are, are constantly having to acclimate themselves to the adult world, so adults get used to it. You have to acclimate yourself here to a kid's world. Wow, wow. Now you know what I mean by banded rock. Uh, it was worth the trip. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeez, oh Pete, my jaw's dropping. Uh, oh my, oh my goodness. I set up stone in here that's thousands of pounds by myself to see if I could do it by going down, using an inclined plane, going down, putting block underneath it and getting it up. And somebody said, so why did you do that when you have an operator? I said, it's like I'm a writer, so I said, the finished product in writing is great, but it's the process of what you learn while you're writing. Or like you guys, I mean, it's what you guys are learning while you're doing this is what you're going to live with. You're going to learn a lot. It's going to change your personalities, you know. I think for some of you guys, for the better. <laughs> <laughs> it is lunar. It faces east. And I'll tell you what I based it on. On November 3rd, on my birthday, when a full moon comes up, it lines up directly through there, yes, and goes to the alder. I'm telling you, it's like everything I do, I just went after this. I thought, and, I t and I, as I tell the, the kids in the yard, I say, when, you know, they'll ask you the question. They'll say, what kept you going? I said, guys, I saw this completed in my mind. You're thinking, the day that I finished this, I stood back and went, oh my gosh, there was kind of that feeling, but it looked just like the picture in my mind. And I said, now it's finally done. Now I can get back to writing. <laughs> you know? Is it finally done? The temple itself is done. These inside of the gardens, I think, are done. I might build a waterfall over here. I got other ideas, and then I got another line of rock over there, and then really it is, it is finished. Good job. It's a temple of tolerance because I think tolerance is the first step in the journey, in, in the journey to enlightenment. If you look at this place, I think the most phenomenal thing is every rock is photographed my wife did the photography, it's photographed and then it's on an index card and I can tell you where every rock came from and every piece of fence. Now again, somebody said, did you do that because you were so obsessed with recording history? I said, for that reason, but also the more intimidating it is they can never destroy this place because they can't say it's just this thing he built because all of Walpawk history is here and it's in those index cards. We, uh, we want to bestow upon you the official Rare Visions and Roadside Revelations right. t-shirt in honor Good. of what you've done here. And I just want to say, yeah. we're, we're not, not worthy. worthy. Oh, thank we're you, not guys. worthy. Definitely. That's thank just you. not Get worthy. That? Oh, that's great. This is, this is awesome, man. You have done an amazing thing. Careful with that ball now. The dawning of a new day finds us once again cramming things into every conceivable corner. But there's always time to share something one of us has learned. It's a Buckeye. That's a Buckeye. Yeah, you were asking about that. It was. It's the Buckeye State, Ohio. But you know, you're supposed to be able to keep rubbing it and it relieves stress and tension. Here, you might want to try that. It's the Buckeye State. And the whole state is based on this thing? Yeah, well, you know. Like gallstones are similar. Yeah, yeah that's Minnesota, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> the Gallstone State. Glad we got that out of the way. But once again, it appears that rocks, not nuts, are the order of the day. Here in Springfield at the Hartman Historical Rock Garden, built during the dark days of the Depression by one Ben Hartman. But not this one, who was just a lad when his dad died in the early 40s. He was always a history buff. Plus, he, had, he was out of work in the, in the Depression. There was no money, no nothing. So he got 50 cents, got a bag of cement, and made something. These are constructed basically the way you would build a, you know, a brick building or, a, well, like a masonry building, all masonry. Was he a mason? No. Well, I guess he was. I mean, he put a lot of things together. But 
Um, you know, he was a molder, an uh, iron molder. So these are all, he made the molds for these figures? He made these figures and the molds for them and the whole nine yards. Like there's different little sayings and things he's put in the concrete there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's supposed to be a, <laughs> heart, a heart in the middle with man, so like heart man. So nobody gets it, I know. Yeah. Well, they, they call it the tree of life. And it has the American flag and the, the globe with the U.S. on it and the American bald eagle on top. And then a school and a church for religion and knowledge, I guess, and, and doves for peace. So I guess that says it all. Noah's Ark and uh, Christopher Columbus's home there. Harper's Ferry? Yeah, Harper's Ferry. Giant you know, what, mushrooms? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a sporting goods store that was in Springfield. Yeah, this was my dad's favorite place to go. Hey, there's the Last Supper. Yep. Yep. Well, and I think they might have done the ki the cooking right here in Mount Vernon's, Mount Vernon's, Vernon's kitchen. kitchen. Yeah. Well, I guess he understood the right proportion steel to, to concrete. You know, you get a, the right percentage in the concrete, and then it's strong. You get too much, it's not, and not enough, you know, falls down. My mom was rather particular about him. Anything that he did, she wouldn't let me touch. You know, just like, you know, leave it alone. So nothing, nothing got fixed, and nothing got, you know, repaired or anything. Did the family come out and live around this stuff? Well, yeah, basically. She said that he said, I built all this for you to enjoy. So then she was saying, now get out there and get that lawnmower and start enjoying it. And the clippers, <laughs> you know, so, so that was a lot of enjoying. <laughs> People still come from all over to see the stuff Ben's dad did. But he says keeping up appearances has less and less appeal and who knows what lies in store for the garden. But here's what lies in store for us, Dublin. Apparently not the one in Ireland though, since no boats have been involved. And no, we can't really explain this striking sight either. So I say, grab the gloves, let's play too. You heard about around the horn? <laughs> around the corn. Be the corn. Oh, watch this now. Be the corn, Dan. Whoa! Yeah, no Peppa. No, no Peppa. Peppa. <laughs> Get corn! The corning track. No, no telling how no long this cleverness oh, might continue, except suddenly we're one producer down. You want to see the pus? No. Looks like Mike's got a faulty foot and headed for the showers. I almost hate to say it, but game called on a count of corns. Don't get sore nothing. In case you're wondering, my feet are fine. And even Mr. Murphy's on the mend, which is good because we're cruising Columbus, the biggest city in Ohio and a great place to find great folk art. Made by such folks as Ralph Bell, William Hawkins, and the Reverend Elijah Pierce, a wood carving barber whose prime pieces have ended up at the biggest museum in town. Had a barbershop for 60 years. Half of the barbershop was dedicated to the barber's trade, because he cut hair right till the end. And the other half of the barbershop became his gallery space. Mr. Pierce was a lay minister, and he really saw these works not as works of art. He saw them as ways of communicating with, with his community. And he called them sermons in wood. And religious subjects were a big part of, his, of the body of work. But he also carved subjects about his own life, and moral stories, moral tales. So it was very much about how to live your life. God talks with me in a natural voice, the way I can hear it and understand it. And he know my name. He called me by my name, Elijah. By the time of his death in 1984, he was an internationally acclaimed folk artist. I mean, he was, people came from all over the country to that barbershop to visit. But it was really only the last decade. Uh, earlier than that, it was really very much about family, friends, community, about people who really knew him. The thing that's interesting about William Hawkins is he uses a lot of uh, popular culture, like photographs from magazines. One of the times I visited him, he would always bring out the National Geographic that someone had given him, or the old Life magazine, and he would take pictures from, he'd like pictures from it, and then he would use his, you know, use them as the inspiration for paintings. 
but large-scale, very expressionistic paintings. They're, they're just fabulous. You cannot, of course, buy the art that's on display here, but over in what's known as the Short North, Duff Lindsay would be glad to sell you some at the gallery which bears his name. Despite spending much of his life in this sleazy business we call television, Duff appears to be a genuinely good guy. I lost the passion for the career that I had before, and I stepped back and said, what do I have passion for? And I have passion for this art and these artists. They're amazing people who just one day got the notion that they'd pick up a hunk of plywood and a can of house paint like William Hawkins or a pocket knife and a piece of wood like Elijah Pierce and decide, hey, I'm an artist. Uh, you gotta love that. Sometimes Duff goes out of his way to encourage those who yearn to create. Take the case of Stanley Greer. Back in his teens, Stan learned to carve with the legendary Popeye Reed. After spending a few years behind bars where no chisels are allowed, he emerged and began to make up for lost time. When I first came out, I just started uh, working on the dry docks and coming down looking into galleries. And then one day I walked into Duff's gallery over here and I seen all Popeye's stones. Duff got me some stone and Help me get some chisels and get started back. And I've been doing nothing but carving pretty much for about almost a year and a half now. Well, that's one thing about carving. Once you do get started, you just want to keep on doing it because that's what you're in the groove of for now. You guys want to stop and talk, and I said, oh, I don't want to carve. <laughs> and then there's Levant. Isaac, that is, who came to Columbus by way of Istanbul and Montreal. One day, a Greenpeace guy going door to door noticed his work on the wall and voila, a career was born. I think people sometimes have trouble categorizing this because it's so slick and so shiny and so technically masterful. To me, he's a contemporary self-taught artist and his work clearly pays tribute to his favorite folk artists. So it's human figures, it's, it's animals. Yeah, it's anything that goes. It's, it, I try and get like a, a story that's been told and retell it in a different uh, way, my way. When I'm not painting, I'm thinking about things to paint. I have all my scrap pieces of wood. I'll walk through alleyways here, scavenge anything that'll, that'll absorb paint, metal, wood. So I'll use all kinds of throwaway things like, like doll parts or something like this. I'm going to thrift store them buy a whole stack of these, which is a little disturbing by itself. A grown man walking around with six <laughs> new dolls under each arm walking through. It's good to have jars of ears, eyes, body parts available. This painting will be a carnival tragedy. <laughs> It'll be a monkey stabbing a clown. <laughs> I mean, he's just had it. There's like too much competition between the two. And like, this is brand new, a friend of mine uh, Jim Rubino, who's been around for, uh, for a long time, he does these wonderful kinetic works. He's been so supportive of my art, and we just got together when they said, why not work together and not make my paintings come to life? And he was all for it. Uh, we sat down, we came up with an idea. I said, let's do a hula, a hula dancer, and let's just have her move her hips around. And she's gonna have that kind of a movement with the grass, that grass over there. Okay, we got this piece here, this will be, Girls jumping rope. Over here, here's an example of the doll's eyes that I'll use in the pieces. And this is um, Mademoiselle Striptease, <laughs> her tassel spin. And this one, you gotta crank by hand on this one over here. But she's, she's still good though. I, I've always had these ideas, but I just never knew how to put the two together. So, I mean, like, if they come to me like this, why not? And these teeth are made out of the coffee cans. What I do is get a coffee can lid, get little snips, and I'll cut little triangles. And these are like uh, paintbrush bristles. Now, if you'd had art lessons early on, would you would this be no I mean, fun at all? No, it wouldn't be fun because I've, I've done a lot of uh, things on my own that I figured out that worked for me. And I show other people and they go, that's, not, that's just an easier way to do it. And I go, show me. And they go, it's not an easier way. 
I'll work on 20, 30 pieces at once. And there's some pieces that I started like 10 years ago, which I, I, I finally come around to working on. You just don't want to force anything. It's just gonna come naturally. And when you start enough work, something will get done. Chances are. This has got double movement here. This is a hypnotist. When you press it here, as you can see, this spins, and our eyes spin at the same time. Pretty cool, but it looks like someone's getting very sleepy. Anyway, Levent needs to get back to finding more parts and making more art, which means it's time for me to say goodbye, Columbus. This is Don, your juggling camera guy, signing off. Go try this at home, kid. Whoa, around the corner. To learn more about the sites you've seen on this show and plan a road trip of your own, visit Rare Visions on the web at kcpt.org. You can also purchase DVDs, videotapes, and a companion book to this award-winning series. Call 1-800-459-9733. How about them Bengals? Is that hollow? No, that's the beauty of it. This isn't hollow. This is, there's no serial filler. This is full to the gills of videotape. And we're full to the gills of something else. <laughs>